Well, good morning. How are you? Hey, as someone said, I was uh, coming in the door. This is a great beach day. And obviously it is, all right? So for those that went to the beach, we will pray they get sunburned really well today, all right? <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding, all right? Uh, just a couple of things. We have some great things to be grateful for today. Uh, we're so glad that Larry Murray is okay from the explosion. We're so grateful for that. As you can tell, he looks like a recruit for the Marine Corps this morning. All right, they shaved his head, you know, and he's recovering and he is getting slowly back to work. So we're grateful that Larry is okay today. I shared with you last week about Audrey's brother-in-law who was suffering from pulmonary fibrosis. And during the Easter and this week, they did a test on him. They were trying to determine what was causing the pneumonia on top of the pulmonary fibrosis. And they told him that when they put him under, he may not even wake up. It was a very risky thing because his lungs were already compromised. He came through the procedure well. He did. Uh, but yesterday, he passed away. Um, so if you want to remember Audrey and our family in your prayers, we will be doing a memorial service for him on May 10th. And uh, I just hope he got things right with God. That's our concern for our family. So as we go into prayer, I want to lift this up as well as God's word for us today. So let's pray. God, we have lots of reasons to praise you and to thank you. We praise you, God, that Jesus came out of that tomb so that we wouldn't have to live in our own tombs. We would not have to be trapped by what life throws at us. God, I thank you that Larry's okay. I'm glad he's going to heal. God, I think it wasn't worse than it could have been. God, I thank you for giving us your, your word today. Thank you for using the Holy Spirit to touch us, to inspire us, to motivate us, to convict us. And God, as we focus on your word today, we want it to be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. We want to hide your word in our hearts so that we will not sin against you. We want your word to take captive every thought we have so that we bring all of our thoughts under the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, I pray today that as we focus on your truth, that we will apply it. As you said 2,000 years ago, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And God, I believe that with all of my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. We're starting a new series today, and it comes from a lot of things I've noticed in people's lives. Uh, I've been reading a lot of books on this subject, Christian books on this, and I'm just looking at how we can have more margin in our life. I, I look at a lot of Christians today who seem stressed out, overloaded. They just seem burdened down. And how do we put some margin back in our life with all of the things we're expected to do? And one of the books I've read, I'm going to give you some lengthy quotes here, but he is a medical doctor. He is a Christian medical doctor. And he has written a lot of books on this subject just from having to treat patients who come to him. And here's what he writes in one of his books. The conditions of modern-day living devour margin. If you're homeless, we send you to a shelter. If you're penniless, we offer you food stamps. If you are breathless, we connect you to oxygen. But if you are marginless, we give you yet one more thing to do. Marginless is being 30 minutes late to the doctor's office because you were 20 minutes late getting out of the bank because you were 10 minutes late dropping your kids off at school because the car ran out of gas two blocks from the gas station and you forgot your wallet. Margin, on the other hand, is having breath left at the top of the staircase, money left at the end of the month, sanity left at the end of adolescence. Marginless is the baby crying and the phone ringing at the same time. Margin is grandma taking the baby for the afternoon. Marginless is being asked to carry a load five pounds heavier than you can lift. Margin is a friend to carry half the burden. Marginless is not having time to finish the book you're reading on stress. Margin is having the time to read it twice. Marginless is fatigue. Margin is energy. Marginless is red ink. Margin is black ink. Marginless is a hurry. Margin is calm. Marginless is anxiety. Margin is security. Marginless is culture. Margin is counterculture. Marginless is the disease of the new millennial. 
Margin is its cure. As a medical doctor, people come into my office exhausted. They come in hurting. The reason these patients come to me, however, is not to discuss their lack of margin. They don't even know what margin is. Instead, they come because of pain. And here's what I want you to realize. Most don't realize that pain and the absence of margin are related. Think about it. Progress has given us unprecedented affluence, education, technology, and entertainment. I mean, we have comforts today that generations never had. Yet, with all this flourishing technology and comforts, all these advantages that we have today, we're still like fish flopping out of a water. We've got all of the things we need, but we're still exhausted. I know stay-home moms who stay exhausted. Think about it if you're a stay-home mom. 150 years ago, 100 years ago, they didn't have washing machines. To wash your clothes, what did you have to do? You had to wash them by hand or go to the creek. Now we have washing machines that do that for you. And now we have dryers that dry your clothes for you. And yet today, we still seem exhausted. We still seem worn out. We are the most blessed, prosperous generation ever. So why are so many people going to therapists? If all this technology is supposed to make our lives more comfortable, why do we feel so crushed by it? And since we have all the technology to make our lives better, why are we not content and fulfilled? So here's my observation about progress. While it promises more comforts and more conveniences, it gives us less and less time and less slower pace of life. I mean, think about it. Technology is supposed to save us time. But as it saves us more time, we are expected to do more at work, at school, at home, at church, etc. So one final quote by Dr. Swenson. He says this. We must, we must have some room to breathe. We need freedom to think and permission to heal. Our relationships are being starved to death by all of this velocity. Notice this. No one has time to listen. No one has time to listen. But look what he says. None of us have time to listen, let alone love. Our children lay wounded on the ground, run over by our high-speed good intentions. Is God now pro-exhaustion? Does he, doesn't he lead his people anymore besides still waters? When I take him to school every Monday through Friday, I'll notice I'm on, you know, getting in a line with parents and dropping their kids off. And as we're in this line, I notice all the kids on their phones with earbuds listening to music and not talking to the parents. Emmy doesn't do that. We talk. We're so busy, we no longer have time for our children who are wounded by all of this technology. I heard about a guy named John. He was 67 years old. He was slim, fit, and active. Following retirement and a heart attack, he determined to take care of himself and have fun at the same time. It was Wisconsin in the summer, okay, and Florida in the winter. As his wife was otherwise occupied, John challenged a friend of his named Glenn, a young guy in his mid-20s, to 18 holes of golf. Approaching the first hole, John drove his ball straight down the middle of the fairway. It was a perfect hit. When his friend Glenn got up, who had not played much golf, Glenn swung vigorously. The ball, however, angled hard right and struck John right in the eye. Blood instantly came gushing out. It came gushing out as his eyeball dropped into his hand. By the time they arrived at the clinic, his friend Glenn was still white as a sheet. The injured John, however, was having a little fun with this. He said, I guess Glenn never knew I had an artificial eye. He said, I popped it out just to make sure it wasn't broken. He said, I didn't really mean to scare him like that. Now, I have a point from that. <laughs> you're going, I don't know what you think. Where is he going with this one? Golf and a glass eyeball. Rarely does a day go by that I don't pick up some broken pieces in people's lives and help them put it back together. I'm constantly dealing with exhausted, hurting, and hopeless people. For many of these people, they're not coming to talk to me 
about their exhaustion. They think they're coming to talk to me about their pain. But pain, you see, drives them to me. And what they do not realize is that their pain is due to lack of margin in their life. So take out your sermon notes, okay? Let's get started on this new series about how do we get some margin in our life. And for the next four weeks, we're going to look at this, okay? I hear people all the time say, I'm overloaded. I just can't get it all done. I can't catch up. I need a break. I'm exhausted. Any of you know what that's like? I mean, you're just running and running and running. In other words, we're overloaded as a people today. And what technology was supposed to do for us, it has not done. It's even made us more exhausted. We're chauffeuring kids back and forth to activities. We've got way too many choices in the world. There are way too many changes in the world. We're overloaded from too much work, too much debt, too much worries, too much information, too much accessibility. The pace of life, the speed of life is just gone. I mean, it's running faster than we can keep up with it. Let me show you some stats. How overloaded are people today? Well, let me just give you some stats. People today sleep two and a half hours less each night than they did 100 years ago. So we're getting less sleep. The average work week in America is actually longer than it was in the 1960s. So we are working longer hours, and we're getting less sleep. In the U.S., 85.8 of males and 66.5% of females work more than 40 hours per week. Americans work 137 hours more per year than Japanese workers, 260 more hours per year than British workers, and 499 more hours per year than French workers. We all have, we have all this technology today that people did not have in the 1950s and 60s that was supposed to give us more margin. All it has done is to make us more marginalized than ever before in our relationships to each other. I think about my own wife. I asked her the other day, honey, how many unread emails do you have on your computer or cell phone? She has over 20,000 emails she's not even read. I said, why are they still on your phone? I would just go, select all, boop, gone. That's me. We're overloaded today. We have washing machines to wash our clothes. We have dryers to dry them. We have HVAC units to heat and cool our houses. We have digital devices that keep us connected. We have cell phones, laptops, tablets. We are a generation that has never been blessed with so much comfort. But yet, notice this. With all of this, why is debt the highest it's ever been in our country? Divorce is the highest it's ever been. Teenage pregnancy is the highest. Illicit drug abuse, crime, incarceration rates, corporate malfeasance, AIDS, litigation, educational breakdown, functional illiteracy is the highest it's ever been in our country. I mean, if progress is so wonderful, why do we drink and drug ourselves to forget our problems? Why are we divorcing and suing at such high rates than never before? Why are people killing themselves? In such high numbers today. I mean, if we are better off than previous generations, then why in the world does it seem we're worse off today? We're chronically rushed. We're chronically exhausted. We are like Job in Job 3.26. I have no peace. I have no quiet. I have no rest. And troubles keep coming. That's our generation today. So today I'm launching this new series entitled Getting Margin Back in My Life. My goal is to help lower your stress, to increase your peace of mind. And to do that, I need to give you a definition of what margin is. So what do I mean by margin? Here's what I mean. Here's what margin is. It is the space between my load and my limits. That's the definition of margin. In other words, what I've got to do, my responsibilities, and then how much energy... And effort is going to take to get it done. Having margin means you've got some breathing room in your life. That you have some reserves in your life. You need margin in every area of your life. You need physical margin in your life. You need spiritual margin in your life. You need emotional margin in your life. You need financial margin in your life. If you don't have this margin, you're going to be overloaded and you're going to be stressed. Your finances are going to kill you. Your health is going to go. Your schedule is going to overwhelm you. So please, don't miss any of these sermons. 
We're going to have four on how to get margin back in our life. I mean, you know me. I don't like to be late for anything. I don't even like to be on time. I like to be 15 minutes early. That's me. That's who I am. I like to work that margin in because I don't know what the traffic's going to be like. I don't know what's going to happen. You can ask my wife and my daughter. I'm not a happy camper if we're leaving on time. I'm not a happy camper, especially if we get there late. I'm hard to live with. I want to get there early. Anybody like that? Okay. Oh, great. I got a whole church full of those folks. All right. We're going to start a support group for us, all right? Because we got to help the other group get there, all right? I know people, they're always rushing somewhere because they're always behind. They're always stressed out by that. And what I've realized is if I add margin in my life, it gives me a little solace. I don't have stress. And putting that margin early into whatever I'm doing has reduced so much unnecessary stress in my life. Just adding that little 15 minutes earlier to leave reduces my stress. Now, in this series, we're going to look at a lot of benefits to this. Benefits in the margin of finances, relationships. All of these sermons are going to cover this stuff. So let me give you briefly what are some of the benefits. What are some of the benefits? Well, if I live with margin, I'll be healthier. That's the first benefit you're going to have. You will be healthier. How? Well, I'll have a healthier mind. You won't be hurried. You won't be worried all the time. You'll have more peace of mind. Here's the second benefit. I'll have a healthier body. Unrelenting stress takes its toll on your body. Your body needs downtime. It needs rest. It needs sleep. You see, one of the reasons God gave us the Sabbath is so that our bodies can rest and recover. You know that in high-performance race cars, they schedule pit stops for a reason. Because it has to have a moment of rest. And if you're living this high-performance life, you're going at a speed and a schedule so fast, you're going to burn out, you're going to burn up. Here's another area you'll be healthier. I have a healthier, I'll have healthier relationships. Here's what sociologists are telling us today. We got all this benefits, we got all this technology. When everybody comes home, everybody's mad at each other. Everybody's short fused with each other. I got this to do, I got this to do, I got this to do. Don't bother me, I got this to do. What do you mean you want me to do this? I can't do that. I got this to do. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This is where we are today because we have overdone, taken on too much. We don't have margin in our life. Instead of the home being a place of joy, it's now a place of stress. And when you have no margin in your life, you start skimming relationships. Your family doesn't get together. You don't do things like you used to because now you've got all these other things to do. Here's another area you'll have, be healthier. I'll have a healthier availability for God to use me. When you put margin in your life, you're more available for God to use you. When you're overloaded, the only thing you can think is survival. You don't care. You don't have time to give to anything else. You're too busy to care. You want to do it, but you don't have time. And some of you, if God wanted to call you and give you some good news, he'd get a busy number. We're spending all of this time doing all this stuff, and our relationships, our marriages, our kids are paying a huge price for it. So are you ready? You ready to get some margin in your life? You ready to get some sanity back in your life? I hope so. So let me tell you how to live with a life of margin. If you want this, first thing you got to do, i got to accept my human limitations. You're not God. You're not Superman. With the new Avengers movie out, you're not Captain America. You're not Thor. You're not Black Widow. You're not Hulk. You're not Iron Man. You see, we think we are exempted from this, that we're invincible. We can just keep going and going and going and going. I thought it was interesting in a recent study posted in Newsweek magazine. It said Americans are getting less sleep than we were 13 years ago. One-third of Americans report getting less than six hours of sleep a night, which is 28.6% increase since 2004 alone. The reasons given are work. We have dual-career marriages today. Parents are having to come home. On top of doing all the work they got to do at work, they got now housework to do. The second reason given is digital technology. More working adults are staying up late at night, surfing the net, responding to emails, and on their cell phones. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 119. I have learned 
that everything has what? Limits. Circle the word limit. Everything has limits. Everything has a limit. And here's why we do not believe that. We're in a culture that says just the opposite. We live in a culture that says there are no limits. I saw on the back of a car the other day, without limits. Everything has limits. But we believe that doesn't apply to us, so we lie to ourselves. You know what? There's never been a bestseller out there entitled, Your Limited Life. There's never a bestseller out there that says, hey, this is the way to get the most stress in your life. They don't tell us that. They know we won't read that. What we do is we buy the lie that we are invincible. We can do it all, have it all, and be it all. You have limits. My wife, who's sitting back there, cannot sing on key. She sings all the time in the house, but she can't sing on key. And it doesn't matter how much we paid for her to go to a vocal person, the teacher to sing on key, to practice on key. She has a problem with intonation, tonation, and pitch. She will never, ever, ever sing in the Metropolitan Opera, okay? Never. She has a limit on what she can do. You're never going to fly like a bird. You will never be able to swim to Scotland. Can you go six months without eating? No. I've seen some people probably could go six months without eating, all right? But you can't do that. We have limitations. Where do you think those limitations came from? They came from God. He put those on us. We are made with certain limits. And if you ignore those limits, your body, your health will pay a price. So what are the limitations you have? Well, let me give them to you. You have some physical limitations in your life. The Bible says everything in my life, everything in my life is limited. Everything in my life has limitations. Everything. So you have some physical limitations in your life. Like I said, you can't swim to Scotland. You can't go without sleep for a week. You have limited energy. Here's your next feeling. Energy management is more important than time management today. In the 60s, it was time management. Today is energy management. Energy management is more important today than time management. We all have the same amount of time, so we need to manage our energy. Here's the second thing. I have emotional limitations. And these are harder to identify, but your life will be affected emotionally by the stress in your life, all the things you're trying to do. You, cannot, you can only carry but so many people emotionally. If I say to you, hey, can you carry Chip Farron? You go, yeah, I could probably carry him. But I say, all right, can you carry Chip and Dennis and Larry and Chris and Keith and Kelly? You go, no way. You have physical limitations. You also have emotional limitations. You can only carry so much. So how many people do you think you can carry emotionally? Three, five, ten? You can only carry so much. Here's another limitation you have. You have mental limitations. There's only so much information you can grasp, take in, process. The Internet is exploding today. Exploding. I mean, they just did a huge study on how much information is out there on the Internet. Look at this. Look at this. Currently, there are so many high-definition defi- high movies on the Internet. If you, could, if you could take it, get this. If you could take and watch every one of them, it would take you 47 million years to watch all of them. There are 1.8 billion websites, and 571 new websites are created every single minute. If you want to watch every high-definition movie that's out there on the Internet, it's going to take you 47 billion years to watch them all. The the results are we have information overload. We get what's called brain fog. I remember my grandmother. Both of my grandmothers had 12 children each. Most of those had 5 to 8, 10 kids each. And so we... When we go to my grandmother's house, <laughs> she'd look at me and she'd say, um, Troy, um, Everett, Fred, um, whatever your name is, get over here. She had information overload. Too many kids, too many grandkids to keep up with. It's called brain fog. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All right, okay. You probably do it with your own kids. You look at one and go, call him by the wrong name. We are so overloaded today, we can't even use the right name. Our brains get tired from the difficulty of trying to process so much. And as a result, we're losing the willpower due to anxiety. Anxiety goes up, study says, as we get overloaded. 
And what you need is a filter. And that's what this whole series is about. Here's another limitation you have. I have time limitations. You got some time limitations. Look what Job says in Job 14, 5. Our time is limited. You, God, have given us only so many months to live, and you've set the limits that we cannot go beyond. I want you to circle that. You have set the limits we cannot go beyond. There are certain limits on this planet humans will never, ever exceed. You'll never have any more than 24 hours a day. You have a time limit. You know, on your cell phone, your phone starts warning you when it gets low. It starts, at least mine does. You got 5% left. You better put this in the charger. So even you have cell phones that say, hey, you need to charge me. You need to charge me. And what God is saying to you today, you got to find time to charge your cell. I mean, you think about it. This thing starts blinking. It starts warning me that my battery is low. You know what it is for you today? It's pain. Pain is a warning that you're stressed out and you're worn out. Stress is a warning. Fatigue is a warning. Apathy is a warning. Irritability is a warning. It's saying, hey, you're overloaded, you're stressed out, you don't have enough margin in your life. And when you don't have enough margin, you lose enthusiasm, you lose focus. Life becomes dull, it becomes boring, there's no joy in it. You wake up in the morning and you hate that the alarm has gone off. You don't want to get up, you don't want to go to work, but you know you have to because you got all these things you bought that you got to pay for. And you're stressed out. So in this series, I'm going to help you learn how to put some margin in your life so that you come to experience that abundant life Jesus has promised you. Is there anything wrong in all these other things? No. There's nothing wrong in having a cell phone, having a laptop, having a tablet. There's nothing wrong. It's just that we don't put margin on it. Okay? So if we're going to live with margin, here's the second thing i got to do. I have to ask myself, what drives me to overload my life? You've got to have some honest evaluation. What's pushing you, driving you to overload your life? The Bible tells us that people overwork for many different reasons. Some people overwork out of insecurity. Some people work out of fear. The book of Ecclesiastes puts it this way. Some people are never satisfied with what they own. And they, are never, they never stop working to get more. They should ask themselves, why am I always working to have more? What a senseless and meaningless life. You need to circle some things in that verse up there. All those things. Never satisfied. Never stop working. They should ask themselves. you got to ask yourself, what's driving me? What's pushing me? you got to do an honest evaluation. Here's the third thing. You're going to have margin in life. Expect to have problems and delays. I mean, nothing ever goes the way you planned. But we act like it does. This is why I leave, very, I leave a whole lot earlier when I know i got to get in College Road on traffic. There's just going to be problems. There's just going to be delays. Think about it. Airline flights are never what they say they are. You always get bumped. always get traded. You always, the plane's always late. The plane's always delayed. They say it takes one and a half hours. It may take two. There's always problems at the terminal. Jesus put it this way. In the world, you'll have trouble. So why are we surprised when it happens? God says expect to have problems. Expect to have delays. I read a true story about a first grade teacher. In her school, you know, she would get the kindergarten kids. And at her school, the kindergartners went home at noon. Right? But when they got to the first grade, they had to stay there for the whole day. So one of her kids was named Ryan. He was accustomed to going home at noon. So when he got around noon, she noticed he was packing up his stuff, packing up his bag. She went over to him. She says, Ryan, what are you doing? He says, I'm going home. She says, honey, you, you don't do that now. You're in first grade. You have to stay for the whole day. we got a little more work for you to do, and you go home about probably about 2.30. He looked at her. He was shocked. He was in disbelief. He couldn't believe it. He put his hands on his hip, and he said, who on earth signed me up for this program? See, part of living with margin involves thinking and planning ahead. Proverbs puts it this way. Sensible people will see trouble coming and avoid it. 
but an unhealthy thinking person will walk right into it and regret it later. So you got to plan ahead. Here's the fourth thing you need to do, okay? If I'm going to live a life of margin, for fourth, I must add buffer space into my schedule. you got to add a little buffer space in your schedule. Some downtime, some buffer zones. And that's what this series is about. The next three sermons are about how to, I'm going to teach you how to have these buffer zones. You, nobody can do this for you. You have to do this for yourself. It's kind of like what I taught you about tithing. You pay God first. That's your tithe. Second, you pay yourself second. That's savings. You put some money in the savings account, and then you live on the rest. What's true with that is going to be true with this. The same principle is you give God the first of your time. Second, you give him part of your time, okay, to do all, to get energized, to get re-energized, okay? And then third, you use the remaining time for your commitments and other things. You pay God first with your time. Second, you pay yourself in a savings account. Third, you live on the rest. What is true with your money is true with your time. Give God the first part of your time. Give the second part of your time to energize and refresh yourself. And third, use the remaining time for all your other commitments and other things. So you need to have some empty pages on your day timer, on your schedule. Psalm 127.2 puts it this way. It is senseless. Notice, it is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night. Look at that. Fearing that you'll starve to death. That's a workaholic. For God wants his loved ones to get their what? Proper rest. You want to circle that, get their proper rest. It's senseless for you to get up and work all day, work all night, and crash in the bed. Here's, here's a good fill-in for you. The faster my speed, the more margin I need. The faster my speed, the more margin I'm going to need. The Bible tells us to schedule a little downtime, a little buffer time in your life. It's foolish to go full steam all day and all night. Ecclesiastes 10.15 puts it this way. Only someone too stupid to find his way home would wear himself out with work. I love that. Only someone too stupid would just work, 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 work. Life's a journey. It's not a 50-yard dash. And it doesn't matter who's running the fastest. It's not about speed. It's about how fast you live. It's not about how well you live. Notice, it's about how well you live. That's the meaning of margin. It's not about how fast you're going. It's about how well you're living. So here's the fifth thing you got to do. If you want margin in your life, I must prune my activities. You prune your brushes. You prune your bushes, I mean, your shrubs. You prune your crepe myrtles, don't you? We do that in order to create new growth. It also provides strength, and it keeps the, that bush, that tree healthy. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I found this interesting. When you go to school, you have to write term papers. They say write in 11, 8 and a half by 11. And most teachers want a one-inch margin. You know, that's what teachers say, one-inch margin. But here's what I want you to notice. A one-inch margin on a standard sheet of papers, 37.4% of the paper's area meaning more than one-third of the page is given to space. And that's just around the edges. When you double space, which most teachers want you to do, notice, over half of the paper is blank white space. You need some white space in your life. You need some margin in your life. Here's what magazines and newspapers have discovered. Having that margin helps you focus and read the article better. They've done experiments by packing it all the way to the edge. People quit reading. It's hard to read it. You need a little white space in your life to function and to carry on. If you don't, you're going to burn out. So how do we apply this to our life? How do we add this to our life? Here's what I want you to know. If you get so many irons in the fire, you're going to put out the fire. If you burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. You will burn out. You will burn up. My generation became workaholics. We work, 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 for all kinds of reasons. That's not how we were designed to go. Jesus talked about having some rest, having some margin in your life. He talked about pruning activities from your life. If you don't, you will burn up, burn out, and you will die way before your time. 
God puts it this way in Ecclesiastes 3, 6. There's a time to keep things, and there's a time to throw some things away. What do you need to throw away? What do you need to stop doing? I saw husbands and wives looking at each other right now. What do you need to prune? Look at Hebrews 12. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. Now, he's not just talking about sin here. He's talking about anything that holds you back. You probably could cut one-third of what you're doing right now, and you'd be healthier. See, not everything you're supposed to do is what God wants you to do. If you don't have time to get it all done, it just means something is either not God's will or you're doing it all in the wrong way. If it's God's will, you will have plenty of time to get it done. 1 Corinthians six twelve puts it this way. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. God's giving you the freedom to choose. Everything is permissible, but it doesn't mean you should do it. You see, some things are not necessarily wrong. They're just simply not necessary. The good can keep you from the best. So you need to learn how to say no. You got 50 things to do, you need to say no to a bunch of those things. No, I can't do it. No, I can't do it. No, I can't do it. I mean, think about it. It's easy to say no to the things we don't like. No, I am not going to get that root canal. No, I'm not going to go get that colonoscopy. It's easier to say no to the things we don't like. And it's harder to say no to the things we do. After Moses died, the people were looking for a leader, and God chose Joshua to be the next leader. Look what Joshua said to the people. This is his um, inaugural address. Some of you are keeping things that God commanded you to destroy. You will never defeat your enemies until you throw away those things. So what are the idols in your life? What are the idols in your schedule? What's the idols in your budget? You think, I just got to have this. I got to have this. I got to spend time on this. I got to watch this TV show. Some of you are DVR and so many TV shows, you can't watch hardly any of them. You just need to go in and delete them. You don't have time for them. Here's the sixth thing. It's the most important thing. If you want to have margin in your life, I must walk and learn from Jesus. To lower your stress, you've got to walk and learn from Jesus. You know, in this book called the Bible, there's not one story that says Jesus was ever in a rush. Never. Even in John's gospel, where Lazarus is dying and he is begged to come and heal Lazarus, Jesus intentionally delayed in going. Lazarus is one of his best friends. Jesus doesn't pick up and say, boys, we got to get there. i got to heal him. He don't need to wait. He waited four days. He waited till Lazarus was dead and gone in the tomb, sealed, over with. And the Bible says he just took his time getting there. And Lazarus' sisters come to him and go, if you had gotten here earlier. You hear the stress? If you had gotten here, none of this would have happened. And Jesus said, do you believe I'm the, the resurrection and the life? Yes. Well, let's go to the grave. Why? Let's go to the grave. They get there, and he says, roll away the stone. And the sisters go, whoop, time out. He's been in there four days. Uh-uh, he's rotting. We don't want to smell that. He's dead and gone. It's over with. And Jesus says, do you believe I am the resurrection and the life? Walk with me. Learn from me. And I will take what is dead and I will give it life. Some of you are literally emotionally and physically, mentally and psychologically dying from overwork. You come home, you're short-fused, you're irritable, you stay up late, you get up early, you go, 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 go. So that what? You can die at 60? That is not how God wired us to live. He wants you to have an abundant life, a joyful life. Some of you dread getting up in the morning. You go. You do it. Then you come home and you bring work with you. And you go, I'm sorry, um, 
I don't have time to do this with you. I can't sit down and do this with you. I can't sit there and talk with you because I, I got work to do. And we wonder why our kids are turning to other things and other people because we're not there for them. I want to share one final verse with you. It's an awesome verse. It's from the message translation. Jesus said this, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Come to me. Get away with me, and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love how that says that. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. So this is going to be an important series for all of us. Because most people in New Hanover County are living without margin. This could radically change your life as you apply these biblical truths. So I hope you're here every week. I hope you take good notes every week. Because most of us, if not all of us, are under stress. Margin makes a difference. One final story for you today. It hurts, said David Tate. He's a mere 180-pound member of the Chicago Bears. He was a defensive secondary. One would think he was discussing taking a hit on the playing field. But the Chicago Bears have a tradition. And it involves using their linemen and their wide receivers and defensive ends. It's called Locker Room Wars, more known as splashing. And what the linemen love to do is find the smallest, and they like to splash them. Now, what that means is they push them into a corner, they get them on the floor, and the brat pack begins to lay on top of them. Tate was dropped to the ground, and the 320-pound refrigerator, you remember him? Collapsed on top of him. Then 270-pound Richard Dent, then 275-pound Dan Hampton, and then another 270-pound Steve McMichael jumped on top. That's 1,135 pounds on a 180-pound man. Tate says, I, I, I don't think they really know how heavy they are. He says, once you've gotten splashed, you avoid it at all costs, even if it means backing down. That's you. You got this on 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 you. And it is pushing you and stressing you and weighing on you. You're overloaded. You're splashed by life. So fill this in. Stress is not the circumstance. It is our response to it. Stress is not the circumstance. It is our response to it. There's only one benefit from an overloaded life. It eventually forces you to God. You have the stroke. You have the heart attack. You have the disease. You collapse, and all of a sudden, God has your attention. So, Southside, I hope you're ready to put some margin back in your life. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that for all of us, we live in an era where it's 